What's up, guys? Doc Danny here with the Doc and Jock Podcast, and I want to talk to you about a product I've been using recently to help with my running, and that is the Shoe Q. The Shoe Q is an insole you put in your shoes, and it has a heel cup that has these little raised up nubs on it, so you'll know if you're landing on your heel or your midfoot or your forefoot. Uh, I've been using this successfully with my own patients to help clean up some some running related issues for the past few months, and myself as well. And I really, really like it. It's really a simple solution to a problem. We know if you land in a overextended position or a heavy heel strike, you will eventually break down and get hurt. If you land in a good solid midfoot, forefoot strike under your center of mass, you're going to be faster. You're going to hurt less. So shoe cue helps solve that problem in a really simple way. So guys, you can get a set of these and save a little bit of money at the same time. If you go and use the discount code jock 10, save 10% on a shoe cue and go ahead and start working on improving your running mechanics. Your body will thank you. Well, cool. Time to talk about this will be a good one. (laughs) Yeah, this will be good. Okay. What's up, guys? Doc and Jock Podcast. It's me, Doc Danny. The other guy is Coach Joe. And the other other guy is another doc. So we got Dr. Doug Kachijan on with us today. I'm going to read a little intro on Doug, and then we're going to get into this. But So Doug's a physical therapist, a strength coach. Um, he's been featured in Men's Health on the Rob Wolf Podcast. He's also the co-owner of Resilience Performance Physical Therapy in New York City, mm. as well as still in the reserves in the Air Force as a PJ and was the NCO of the year in 2015. It's non-commissioned officer officer of the Air Force, which is pretty damn impressive. All of that, that's a lot of stuff. So you're into a lot of things. Um, I did a, a, a little bit of an intro there for it, but Doug, I tell you what, why don't you give everybody a little background on yourself, a little more in depth than what I did so they'll kind of know where you're coming from. Yeah, no, thanks, Danny. Thanks, Joe, for having me on. And uh, that was a pretty thorough introduction. I mean, no one really likes talking about <laughs> themselves good, right? too much. So yeah, I mean, yeah, you pretty much nailed it. I'm a private practice physical therapist in New York City. And I, you know, just based on our conversations before the show here, I mean, I think you and I see eye to eye on a lot of things as far as kind of blending performance training with physical therapy. So that's kind of what we're trying to do here in New York. And then, um, so prior to physical therapy school, I was a uh, active pararescueman in the Air Force, did that full time for about six to seven years, and then went to grad school in the in the Air National Guard. It's a pretty good good deal. So I got to go to school nine months a year, learn PT, and then you know two to three months on my vacations, I was doing PJ training. And for people who don't know what a PJ is, it's basically the uh, only career field in the military that's devoted to technical rescue and personnel recovery. So we get embedded with a lot of different groups from various uh, branches of the military, and we're doing things from like medical treatment to extrication, high mm-hmm. angle rescue, parachuting, diving. So it's a lot, a lot of disciplines. And so obviously between you know, keeping myself uh, proficient in PT and then doing that, it's, uh, it's a challenge, but it keeps things interesting. Yeah, the, the PJ stuff seems unbelievable. And, you know, it's, it, it's an interesting question for me because, you know, I'm someone who's at an arm's reach with um, military personnel, my wife being in, right, and me kind of being the, 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 the daddy daycare runner up doing some of this stuff on the side. But the question for you is, um, Doug, wh- you know, there's there's lots of different specialized military courses or, or – um, avenues people can go, and some of them seem to get a lot of fanfare. But it doesn't. It seems to me like this PJ group seems. You guys are doing some amazing stuff and have to have a pretty amazing skill set. And not only are you guys in charge of maybe going into some crazy areas, but I'd imagine you have to pull people out of there. So I guess the question might be, why not so much fanfare with with this? Uh, this elite group, this PJ group, and in, in comparison to, in, excuse me, in comparison to some others. Yeah, I mean that's a great question. Obviously, I'm biased, but I think it's one of the better kept secrets in the military. I mean, yeah. I think that you know the question that you're asking is something that the Air Force is asking us to how to kind of get the word out more because kind of in these specialized units, there's this whole mantra of like being a quiet professional, but at the same time, if you want people, if you're if you're not filling out the ranks like you want to. You have to kind of promote yourself a little bit. So that's more of a, of a big picture issue. I would say the reason why people don't hear about it as much is because, and pretty much any high profile mission that people hear about on the news with other kind of special operations units, like usually there's a PJ and a, a combat controller, which is the other uh, special operations group in the Air Force, very specialized skill set. But I think that's probably one of the reasons why people don't know about it as much because pararescue is really more of a medically oriented job. So I think people mm. who tend to join like, you know, like, like, like a SEAL unit or like a Ranger unit or even like an Army Special Forces unit. They're a little bit more kind of training and, and cultural stuff than those other two groups. But 
Um, you know, if, you, if you're a PJ, the people who typically are attracted to that, that mission don't necessarily want to be shooters first. And so yeah. not that we're not trained as combatants and to defend ourselves, but our primary job on a mission, and if we're embedded with life force, we're typically not going to be the first guy in the door going up to a target clearing the room. We're there as a contingency in case, you know, one of our guys gets hurt or even to, you know, to treat, treat an enemy and keep that person alive for intelligence reasons and stuff like that. So it, it, it usually attracts a different kind of person. For me, I didn't know anything about it at all till my senior year of college. And I was actually like pre-med, had taken all the courses, taken the MCATs, interviewed at schools. And I graduated college in, in 2002. And so obviously September of 2001 of my senior year was a pretty big event happened. And just based on all the, um, the press that the military got, I saw a special on pararescue. And I'm like, wait a minute, there's you know a special operations job that combines emergency medicine and has the same kind of physical challenge and you know the skill set of some of these other groups but it was a mission that that appealed to me a lot more than some of the other ones so that's kind of why I joined and I, I ended up just withdrawing my applications and going and, and doing that because I, I figured you know I could always go back to school and do something more academic but you know you're, you're better off doing something like power rescue when you're young and don't have a lot of tread on the tires uh, but I think that's why people don't know about it as much because it is so specialized and we're, we're really there as a contingency to provide a medical and a technical rescue capability, and we're not, we're not like an assault force. So it's, you know, we don't have a movie either. That's probably another reason. Maybe that's something we should work on. But yeah, I mean, it's a secret, and it probably shouldn't be, but uh, that's anybody's guess as to why the word isn't out there more. Well, uh, along with the movie you just brought up, maybe you should do it. Put Charlie Sheen in the role, or maybe the, the, the current version of him, right? Or the other thing is maybe more than a movie, you guys need like a, uh, you need like a network drama. Kind of like the the cop dramas or the firefighter. So, uh, but uh, you got to kick that up to your Air Force guys. Yeah, when, when I uh, you know if I ever have that kind of influence, maybe I will. But I'm pretty low on the totem pole right now, so I don't know if they're going to listen. <laughs> well, I tell you what, you know, Johnny uh, Bar Barbell Johnny, the uh, uh, the back end to the Doc and Jock podcast, who handles so much for us is uh, and does all the uh, producing of the podcast, um, was a PJ as well, and. You know, I've had some some interesting conversations with Johnny about some of the training and, and him describing jo uh, drown proofing to me was w sounded pretty bad. So, you know, I, I drown proofing. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, maybe, well, Doug, why don't you, I tell you, I guess, why don't you explain what that is? Because it sounded really bad. Yeah. Well, so drown proofing itself is not unique to power rescue. Basically, any uh, any people who train as combat divers in the military have to go through like a pre scuba selection. One of the events is drown proofing, where they basically tie your hand, your feet together and your hands behind your back, and they make you, you know, bob up and down the deep end of the pool. They make you travel like a porpoise through the water, and then like do things like you know, grab a mask at the bottom of the pool with your teeth, sit there and float. So the it's it's, it's kind of like basically to test your confidence in the water. Yeah. And then the other justification is, you know, if you ever parachute into the water and you get tangled in your lines, it's a, it teaches you to stay calm. Uh, but we did other things besides that that are kind of more unique to power rescue. But yeah, I mean, I'll never look at a pool the same way, but you know, it sounds like it's sadistic for the sake of being sadistic, but it actually does have a purpose. And the, the idea is not to, to drown people, but it's to induce stress in a controlled environment. Right. And you know, obviously, you know, you can only simulate stress so many ways. You, you can't simulate combat. So they, they do the best they can with the water stuff. And at least in pararescue, what weeds the most people out is the water. And they do a very good job of making the pool a scary place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, it, it, right. It, sure. It can totally be. And, uh, yeah, if you if you've ever like been in the ocean and you know I know with with me with surfing getting like tumbled around in the in a wave and Ooh. accidentally like sucking some water in it's, it sucks not a cool feeling but being able to stay calm with that is is you know that's something that Johnny was was saying a lot of people had a hard time with so so yeah no you guys go through some pretty cool training and a lot of medical training and that's you know I've worked with some PJs whenever I was in the army and I was really impressed by the medical knowledge um, very much uh, similar to the uh, special forces medics that I've worked with in terms of their just like general understanding of so many areas uh, if they needed to extract a tooth from me they could do it or if they had to do like a minor surgery no problem. You know, like they, they have a very, very broad skill set and um, they're, they're a fun group to work with. So I, I think it would do nothing but transfer over uh, to, you know, outside of that in terms of the medical field that you're in now. So, so why, why physical therapy, I guess? I mean, that's a, that's a question I think, you know, any practitioner might want to know from you because um, the, the natural course of action that I've seen is a lot of these guys end up going to PA school. They end up going to, you know, physician assistants. It's the kind of shortest course of action to get into a more advanced medical degree. So why PT? Yeah, I mean, another good question, one that I, I get a lot. I'm sure you get a lot. And I, I knew, when I was, like I said, undergrad, 
my, my intention was always to go to medical school and do primary care sports medicine. I didn't want to, surgery didn't appeal to me as much. I kind of was always, you know, into training and, and actually more of the performance side of things. And so having, you know, gone through a lot of medical training in the military and it worked in hospitals, I learned a lot more about actually what physicians do in a sports medicine setting. And, you know, so I chose PT because when I educated myself more on it, you know, as a PT, I feel like you get a little bit more um, education and like in movement assessment and preventative things. You get to spend more time with patients. And if you want to, you can kind of delve more into the performance side of things. Whereas even as a primary care sports medicine uh, physician, that, that's a little bit harder to do just because of how they practice in their, in their business model. But I mean, really, I don't think there's any perfect academic program that, that prepares someone like, you know, like you or I to do, do the things that we do on a daily basis. I think you have to kind of figure out, you know, what's going to be the best sort of blend between professional autonomy, cost of education. Because like for me, you know, I, I had the GI Bill, so the, the government pretty much paid for my entire tuition. Now, if I had to take a quarter of a million dollars in loans out like a lot of my classmates, I don't know if I would have been as gung-ho to do PT. I mean, in an ideal world, sure, you wouldn't make a career decision based on, based on money, but being in a quarter of a million dollar hole is a pretty big deal. Yeah. So for me, you know, PT provided kind of like, it's a doctoral degree, so you have a decent amount of professional autonomy. You, you mix that with like earning potential, and it's, you know, it was, it was three years instead of if I had gone the medical route, because I, you know, I didn't start PT school until I was 30. So even if I'd done a primary care sports med medicine fellowship, you're looking at four years of, of medical school, three years of a primary care you know, internship, whether it's internal medicine, emergency medicine, and then a one or two year sports medicine fellowship. And granted, mind you, I'm only going getting any kind of advanced degree because I want to do sports medicine type things. So had I gone that route, the, the medical school route, I would have really only would have gotten one or two years of the training that I wanted in, in nine years. And so it's like, whereas in PT school, it's three years. And so even if you account for that six year difference, I could probably be a lot further along with a practice because you're still starting from scratch after your fellowship if you go the medical school route. So not to say that like one's better than the other, but it's obviously always kind of like a risk reward type thing. And for me, I think it was the best thing, but I get people all the time who are like, you know, I'm a strength coach now. I want to learn more about the kind of, you know, I want to get manual therapy skills and learn more about the rehab side of things. Should I do massage therapy school, PT school? And I'm like, well, it depends on, you know, how much money you have saved, how much time you want to spend. There's no perfect answer, but there, there's, it's like anything else. It's a, it's a cost and a, and a benefit to each of them. And you really have to kind of break it down and figure out what's best for you. And I, I think that was, that was best for me at that point in my life. I think it's cool that you bring up the, the cost and the benefit and kind of being practical about what you want to study. Like, for example, you know, I went to a small liberal arts college and I, I went into that school, not even considering the fact that I really just wanted to, you know, teach public school. So it's like accumulating, you know, a hundred thousand dollars in, you know, debt and bills to go teach at a public school kind of doesn't make a little bit of sense. So I think that's really good advice to, to give to people looking at what they want to study. You know, we can you get this idea of college that it's like this place of self-discovery and let's go learn all this and do whatnot. But honestly, you forget that there is a bill attached to the end of that experience. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, so that's a real, I think that is great advice. And the, the other thing you said there is, you know, you're bringing a performance and wellness and it seems to me like you kind of went into your studies thinking that you wanted to be ahead of the curve in terms of not generally just fixing disease and fixing people who were broken, but maybe getting in front of it and and getting people stronger so they're so they're almost not seeing you. Um, am I far off in in um, kind of assessing assessing no, that? No, that's that you're spot on, and, and I would caveat that with if you want to get into like the performance side of things and be a clinician, regardless of what you know, academic route you take, whether it's medical school, massage therapy school, PT school, chiropractic, you're not going to learn that high performance stuff. Like, so pretty much anything that you do, you have to get a credential to put your hands on people. But like, if you, if you want to do the things that the people on this podcast do, like you had Quinn on last week, you know, you, you you've got to educate yourself. So, I mean, you need that. I think people need to understand that mm. school, that the, any academic program's job is to prepare you to pass a license exam. And that, like, that's not a good thing or a bad thing. That's just, that's what they need to do to make themselves successful. And then it's really on you to learn what you want. So as far as the performance stuff goes, I mean, it was always a personal interest. And then, you know, I, I think that I'm preaching to the choir here, but I don't think you can rehab somebody adequately unless you have an understanding of that. I mean, if, all, if your only capability is to get somebody out of pain and you're trying to prepare them for, I mean, even, even high school sports, like doing clamshells and, you know, transverse abdominus activation, is not, it's not rehabilitation. Your job is to 
you know, is to sort of systematically impose stresses on people so that when they encounter that stress in real life or on the field or in their job, whatever the case may be, that they're, they're accommodated to that. And that, that stress that they encounter when you're, they're discharged is not going to be overwhelming. And so, I mean, if you're, if you're a physical therapist and you don't know anything about sprint progressions, change of direction, even, ha- you know, movement under load, then unless, unless you're working with a patient who you know has a very competent strength coach, you're, you're leaving a lot of potential on the table and you're not, I don't think, you know, rehabilitating the person. So it was more of a thing like if, if I actually want to be good and not waste people's time and money, I'm going to have to learn more than, than what I learned in PT school. And the other thing is, you know, just because we are interested in that stuff, not everybody goes to PT school to get people to run faster and lift heavier weights. Like, do, you know, teaching someone how to, you know, walk after a stroke is just as valuable, if not more so, than, than what we do. And this is just my personal interest. So you can't expect, you know, a PT school to just totally cater to your very specific thing. It would be like if you went to medical school and wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. Like, you need that general education, too. And it does help to be well-rounded and appreciate some of the medical problems that people have because – you are a clinician, so your, your job first and foremost is to make sure that you rule out any kind of a medical red flag because, so that you, you can adequately refer out and you're not wasting someone's time when they're better served going to a mm. specialist who can fix a, a much greater problem than their shoulder hurts. So does that kind of make sense? Hundred percent. Oh yeah, it's, I think it's a great explanation. And you know, and you brought up uh, continuing education. And I hundred percent agree that. Uh, where you got your degree from means uh, very little uh, base, uh, compared to what you do after you get out of that school um, in terms of continuing education and mentors and experiences. And so uh, you know, for you, the continuing education that you've gotten into, one of the things that you've, you've kind of gone, um, gone into is the postural restoration uh, approach. So why don't you kind of touch on what that is and one of, uh, a reason or two why you decided to actually do a lot of work with them? Yeah, so I, I was first introduced to it um, right before I started PT school. I did an internship at Eric Cressy's facility in Massachusetts, and he was starting to implement it. And, you know, when someone like Eric does something, there's probably a reason why he's doing it, and you should probably do the same thing if you're in this field. Um, but, you know, at, at the time, I had very little understanding of it, and I'm just like, this stuff just looks really weird. Like, why are they doing things on one side, not the other? Mm-hmm. Why do they have guys squatting with rounded backs? Not squatting under load, but, I mean, you know, everything up until that point, I'd been uh, – introduced to is like neutral spine. You know, you should never, ever flex your spine. Someone's disc is going to shoot out their back and hit somebody in the eye. And so, you know, and a lot of this field tends to be very polarizing and dogmatic and not that nuanced. So at that point, it was like, you know, I think people were taking some of that spine biomechanics research and taking it out of context a little bit where it was like, you should have this fixed rigid spine all the time. And so, you know, at that point, I wasn't, I didn't feel compelled to actually take the courses. But then when I was in PT school, I kind of I remember, uh, I think it was Joe Heiler on his Sports Rehab Expert podcast, had a, um, did an interview with Ron Haruska, the, the, the creator of PRI, and he was talking about all these things where, you know, one of my, my biggest sort of frustrations with PT school is that they teach, you know, and it makes it easier to learn, there's a purpose for it, but it's, it's very reductionist in that they teach like cardiopulmonary rehab and, you know, neurological rehab and orthopedic rehab as separate disciplines, but as, as you know, Danny, you know, when you're in the clinic, like how many people, I mean, even if you were doing your, your, your uh, inpatient rotation, you could see a, uh, a stroke patient or a TBI patient or a spinal cord patient who, you know, maybe they don't have use of their legs. And now their primary mode of ambulation is their arms with a wheelchair. Yeah. So position, shoulder position still matters to them. So, and, and, you know, Ram was talking about how, like, even, you know, how, how the diaphragm can inf- influence shoulder mechanics and how the autonomic nervous system is, is really driving all this tone in the body that, that kind of leads to these biomechanical compensations. And, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the orthopedic focus is, I think, driven far too much from what surgeons do, you know, in our field. And our, our field is unique in that we can't do anything to explicitly change anatomy. What we're really doing is changing motor control and position. And that a lot of times that spares the anatomy. But we're not, you know, if, if someone comes into us with a partial labral tear, we're not changing that. That's Or, or you know label tear on the hip or FAI, but we can change position. And the big thing with PRI, the emphasis was on, you know, sort of manipulating the autonomic nervous system um, to alter orthopedic position. And it's not the only approach that does that, but what was cool about PRI was the emphasis on asymmetry and how some of these neurological and anatomical asymmetries that we have inherently predispose us to certain motor patterns under stress that can lead to more predictable orthopedic pathology, compensation, and biomechanics. So when you understand you know, how asymmetry can influence that stuff, 
it makes it easier to intervene. And, you know, so when you're seeing someone who's squatting, for example, a barbell squat, which, we, you know, it's a language we can all speak, but they're, they're shifting to one side. A lot of times, we, you know, as coaches, we try to cue people, hey, don't do that, or try to squat equally on both legs. But if neurologically and autonomically, they, they're in a, a motor pattern that won't let them do that, you can cue them all you want. If you're not, you have to provide the right neurological input to get them to change that behavior. And you can't always cue people out of bad technique. It could be, you know, it could be a positional issue that you need a, some kind of a, you know, a manual therapy technique, or it could even be a non-manual technique like a PRI exercise or some kind of motor control thing. But so kind of like the emphasis on asymmetry and, and sort of combining all those different disciplines within PT and the integration is what made it really intriguing. So I heard that podcast. I signed up for my first course. It was the respiration course with Mike mm-hmm. Cantrell in Houston. Oh, he's a stud. And, um, stud. And, and I think he's in your neck of the woods, actually. Yeah, he is. He's just south of here. Yeah. And so even, uh, you know, I took that course and I was like, I really, I, I know I need to learn more about this stuff. I didn't understand it even the first time I took it. It took sort of more and more repetition. And I was lucky enough that, and this is something that for people who are interested in physical therapy school, I would say if you have this sort of niche interest in like performance physical therapy, go to a school that lets you set up your own affiliations. I was lucky enough to have that. So once I knew that I wanted to learn P- more about PRI, I set up affiliations with people who were versed in it because it's such a huge paradigm shift and it's so different th- from what we learn in school that if you just take a course, it's very hard to implement on Monday. And I had the luxury of having these mentors to put me through it. And also people who you know didn't just drink the PRI coolie but integrated it with other things like manual therapy and you know, like SFMA and, and some of these other things that we see because there's no one system that has all the answers. But so having people who can apply the PRI in context was really valuable. Um, so yeah, that's how I got into it. And then just, like I said, it answered a lot of the questions that I didn't get with the traditional approach. And even in my own training, like how come I can't hit these positions? And then with these sort of very strange looking exercises, you're, you're, you're getting mobility and motor control that you didn't have before. And so it definitely resonated from that standpoint. So this is fired up, Doug. You're you're giving our um. We actually do. We're finding that we read our reviews. We're getting a ton of physical therapy students or even undergrads who are thinking about physical therapy. So you guys listening, you know, Doug's kind of giving you a, a roadmap to uh, look for the, a really good PT school where you can really pursue your interests. So that's cool. So, t- so the, with this PRI approach, so pretty neat. You know, you got you got power lifters. These guys want big performance. They want to pick up heavy things and go nuts, or even CrossFitters who want to move fast. How, how are we getting buy in? from these athletes right away and where might you start them on this, this neurological training to, to, to not only work for better positions, but to utilize them better? Yeah. I mean, that's a good question because if you just give people esoteric stuff without an explanation for it, they're going to look at you like you have two heads. So I would say you have to speak their language and I can give you a perfect example. Um, there's a really high level Olympic lifter at solace. And one day I was watching her snatch and she just, couldn't finish her pull. Like she, she didn't have any hip extension. And so it caused her to have to compensate when she was getting under the bar. Like she was just driving herself too far forward. She was on her toes, couldn't find her heels and it, it affected her overhead position. And then just looking at her, like she was very, very, I mean, people always preach like T-spine extension, which you need for overhead motion, but she was extended to the point where she almost had a, uh, like a reverse curve in her, in her thoracic spine. And you, you, you actually want a little bit of a kyphosis, not a hyperkyphosis in your thoracic spine. And if, you, if you're almost lordotic in your thoracic spine, then it kind of changes center of gravity and it's going to cause other compensation. So I looked at her and I'm like, do you, do you have any kind of like back pain or knee pain? Because the way that you're pulling, I'm like, I'm like, you have trouble finishing your pull, don't you? She's like, yeah, I can never, I can never get myself to do it. And so watching that, I'm like, well, let me, you know, let me take a look at you, you know, because we, we all work together. We want to help each other out. And she's helped me with stuff in my own, my own training and lifting. So got her on the table and you know you, you, do, you have to do these tests to corroborate what you see with your eye and the gross movement. So with any kind of these movement gross movement is great, but you still have to break out the individual joints to see what's going on cuz there's a lot of reasons why somebody, you know, might not snatch well, obviously. Um, so doing some of the uh, traditional orthopedic tests and PRI tests, she had even on the table in a non-threatening non-dynamic environment, she was missing a lot of hip extension. So if you can't access that on the table passively, I don't know how you're going to do it with 200 pounds on the bar. So, That's right. and you know, it was, it, it was, you could look at a rib cage. She had pretty prominent rib flares. Um, she had a hard time even just like doing a very low level, like, like a hip bridge where I, I just biased her where she had to feel her hamstring. So I, I got her like where she was laying supine, laying on her back, 
I got her to reach to get her ribs down and get some abdominal activation and just had her drive her heels into a bench and go into a hip extension without using her back. And she was getting a hamstring cramp and, and couldn't do it. Or do, you know, just some, some exhalation work with hamstring activation. And like for someone who's as strong as her, like it kicked her ass and she was cramping and, and had to stop just because, not because she's weak, but because she has a certain strategy where in Olympic lifting, you need extension and these high threshold strategies to stabilize yourself. So it's not that, you know, like people need to go, people who are in these extension strength sports like power, strongman or Olympic lifting need to bend or flex like, like a dancer or a gymnast, but they need enough variability where their body doesn't think in the performance mode all the time. Because if you, if you're so stuck in extension, you can't get out of it. You know, that, then your pelvis goes too far forward. Your ribs are up in the air. Then you're going to have a hard time extending your hips in a pull. And if you watch the really good Olympic lifters, I mean, they, they, they have that hip extension and they don't compensate much, if at all. So at, at, the, at, at the elite level of performance, these guys actually move. There's this mis misconception that, like, a lot of these elite athletes move like crap and they just compensate well. That's true for a lot of them. But in a sport that requires you to train with the volumes that Olympic lifters train with, they either are genetically blessed and move really well to begin with or they've trained themselves to do it because you can't handle that kind of volume if, if you move like crap. So then we did some just, you know, some of the basic PRI work. And then I even got her like on a, a, uh, on a glute hand bench and I had her do a very strict glute ham race. Not even full, full range because that would have been too much, but through a partial range of motion just to get her to feel her hamstrings. Because she's always like, I can never feel my glutes or my hamstrings in a squat. I'm just so quad dominant, which makes sense if she's always on her toes and can't find her heels. And just getting her to do, like, go down like an inch or two in a glute ham raise where I didn't let her use her back. I physically held her ribs down and had her cross her arms so that she couldn't cheat. It was like cramp city and she, she couldn't do. So not that she needs to, she still needs to Olympic lift. And that's always going to be her bias and that she's always going to be patterned as an Olympic lifter. But if she's so patterned that she can't do some of these very low level things, like I'm not asking her to do anything crazy. I'm asking her to blow up a balloon and feel her hamstrings. And if that's difficult, then you're giving up a lot of athletic potential. So you've got to speak their language, look at the gross movement, and, and you've got to give them a reason why they can't do these things on their load. Because the idea of doing these PRI exercises or even some of these motor control exercises that are associated with physical therapy is not to lay on the table for the rest of your life. It's to get you to do higher level things. But if you look at that performance spectrum, joint, good, joint position is the foundation of it. And all we're doing in high performance is we're adding load, we're adding speed, we're making the environment more chaotic, we're adding fatigue. But if you don't have that gross movement competency, then you can perform. And if you're lucky, you might get away with bad mechanics. But at a certain point, it's hard to buffer those bad mechanics with a lot of volume and a lot of fatigue. So why not, you mentioned the preventative approach, why not intervene beforehand? And the idea is not to have people do quote unquote corrective work all day. It's to get them to do just enough of it that they can train without having all these aches and pains that are otherwise a lot of times preventable. Now, if you're training hard enough, no matter how diligent you are with some of this stuff, you're going to have injuries, but there's still a lot that we can mitigate if we're intelligent in the approach. You know, I I think that's a really smart way of putting it in terms of um, the corrective exercise in particular. I see a lot of people that just do a ton of corrective exercises and doesn't doesn't really change anything uh, be, because they assume that the dots are connected neurologically once they start training and they do their corrective exercises uh, separate from you know getting back under the bar or wherever it might be. Um, so it, that's a good way to look at it. So what's the the minimal effective dose in these non uh, sport-based activities that can help you do better in those, uh, and then get back into your, into your actual lift. So you, you'd also reference torso position. And I think this is really interesting because, uh, it surprises people that come to see me how often I address, um, rib flares where the ribs are just popped forward. And in fact, many people don't even realize that it's an issue until you point out that it's an issue. And, uh, you know, I've seen some pretty, pretty crazy things, you know, I'm sure you, you have as well, where, you know, people have these very prominent rib flares and all of a sudden we start doing some manual therapy to get their ribs back in a better position. And, you know, they add 30, 40 pounds in their deadlift and, 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 uh, they, and they don't really care why that happened. All they know is their deadlift is more now, but I think the rib flares or the rib, um, self-assessment is something that people can really get a lot of information out of. So, uh, if you were to have somebody say, all right, you know, if you want to take a look at your rib cage, um, what's the best place for somebody to look at that? And then if you find a rib flare, if you can kind of explain what that is as well, what are some things that they may be able to do to themselves to help uh, just like the low hanging fruit of trying to get it in a better position? Yeah. So I think that anytime you just look at somebody, you know, whether it's like static posture 
structural stuff or even identifying a rib flare, it, it may not matter with objective tests. So where it would matter to me is typically, you know, without getting too deep into the asymmetry and, and I can, um, you know, put some links on the, on the website. People want to read more about the research and what these, these patterns are, but you tend to see rib flares a lot more on the left side than the right side because of these asymmetries. So if someone has a, a rib flare on the left, left side, you know, we learned in, in PT school these laws of rib and spinal mechanics. So if you have a rib flare on the left side and, and you don't have a rib flare on the right side, that means that the thoracic spine is rotated to the left because when your ribs go down on the right and up on the left, that they articulate with the spine, the spine's going to rotate to the left. Why does that matter? That matters because your scapula goes along with the ride. So if your scapula goes along for the ride, you've got these ribs that are internally rotated on the right. That's going to put your shoulder blade in this position of internal orientation. And this is why you see people who most of the time lack internal rotation on the right side compared to the left. It's not that their posterior capsule is tight or they have all this tissue tonicity. It's a hard end feel because the scapula follows the rib cage. So when you go to rotate the arm bone or the humerus internally, the humor, it's essentially an impingement. So it's kind of like, think of range of motion as like a door in a door frame. I use this analogy all the time where if if your frame that's a little, a little bit canted, you go to shut the door, one of the corners of the door is going to hit the door frame. And the answer is not to always slam the door shut or all the hinges, get the door frame in a more neutral position. And that, and now if the door isn't shut, now maybe you need to oil the hinges and do a joint mobilization or a stretch, but don't, don't treat something as a tissue problem when it's a positional problem. And so that's why the rib position is important because what you see a lot and is people with these rib flares, rib, rib, a rib flare or posterior rotation of the rib cage in the front is spinal extension. You need some spinal extension under load to overcome gravity and over, overcome a weight. But the problem is if you walk around with these rib flares all the time, then your, your really deep, deep abdominal stabilizing muscles like your internal obliques, your transverse abdominis, they don't stabilize very well. So you've got to rely on these prime movers like rectus abdominis, pecs, lats to stabilize you, which once again, under load, having big muscles to stabilize you is not a bad thing. You need it. But when you're that off, if you can't get those ribs in a good position when you're not training especially, then you're using this high threshold stabilization strategy when you don't need it. And that's, that's actually very fatiguing and stressful to the system. Like why, if you can, if you can stabilize yourself with 5% effort throughout the day, just standing around or sitting in a chair, why use, you know, 50% or more? And that's what happens with these rib flares and, the, and these, you know, when people don't prioritize spinal position, but even under load, it matters because if you're in this massive state of overextension, I'm not going to say extension, but really prominent. I mean, it's like one of those things where you know it when you see it. I know there are people who say that mechanics don't matter and, you know, they're kind of like very sort of almost nihilistic about movement. But, you know, where you, people are just really overusing their back and their spine moves into extension a lot under load. People who they're going to have a hard time, like this Olympic lifter I mentioned, actually finding their hamstrings and their glutes. And those are some of your most powerful extensor muscles and if your pelvis is really anteriorly rotated which it will be if your ribs are flared up in the air you're gonna have a hard time accessing that posterior chain so people love to talk about posterior chain work but if you do it when your ribs aren't in a good position you're actually not always training what you what you want to train so it, it it's important for a lot of reasons but i mean and other people have talked about this that you've had on the show it you've got to prioritize you know, proximal or rib, or rib cage motor control first and position, because if you don't do that, then the extremities have to compensate. You're not going to get the most potential out of the extremities. So I think people, you know, if you take it to either extreme, you know, we're not saying don't, don't do extension-based movements. We're just saying don't do too much extension. And more, like I said, it's one of those things where, you know, see it, people can argue the minutia, but you're giving up a lot of potential if you don't if you don't prioritize spinal position and, rib, and, and that really starts with the rib cage because it's very easy to fix. It's a matter of just exhaling a certain way or biasing your body in a certain position. And the reason that the PRI incorporates the breath is because if you have to breathe in a position, then you're, it's very hard to use a high threshold strategy. And all we want is for these people who are in these high threshold disciplines, strength sports, sprinters, to just be able to stabilize themselves for the low threshold strategy when they're not playing sports, which, you know, once again, if you know what you're doing, it's not that difficult. So to go to your question of what's the minimum effective dose, I mean, it's always what, what gets the change you want. But in my experience, all, all you really need to do for most people is just maybe, you know, like two, two of these exercises in the warm up just to kind of, you know, set that joint position and then have them go and train. But, you know, once again, if, if we're saying that joint position is the, is the sort of the, 
the base of this performance pyramid, if, if you, you don't fix that before you train with some of this like activation or mobility work, it's going to be harder for you to find when there's weight on the bar and you're under stress because at that point you're you're competing essentially and you're, you're you know um, so it, it doesn't always take a lot where it takes a lot is a lot more if people are genuinely tight so using the door frame analogy if you do this repositioning work and this rib cage work and people are still risking ma- range of motion like that's me I can do all this stuff and I still like I'll still miss internal rotation in my hips because I have legitimately tight posterior capsule and so, you know a, a lot of tone on in my in my really long stretching where you're trying to change tissue and it takes a long time to change tissue so when i see people like that i've got to kind of buffer their expectations so i'm like this is not going to change as quickly as the 130 pound girl who's got no or anywhere bony blocks that are much more easy to change with motor control but i i think that most people actually are not that tight and quinn spoke to this last week it's really oftentimes more of a positional or a motor control issue so for those people it often doesn't take a lot and then once they get to a certain point it's like anything else else once you easy to maintain it so once you get them to where you want them you don't need them doing a whole lot of these repositioning activities before they train it can maybe be something as simple as doing one exercise for like four or five breaths and then and then go do your specific warm-up you know do your light sets of squats or snatches and go train because you still need to learn to move well under load and I, I move, good movement under load is the most corrective thing there is i mean because that's going to resonate way more with the nervous system than laying on your back and blowing up a bull- that's a piece of the puzzle, but my agreement is you should be able to do both. And if you if you can squat, you know, 400 pounds, but you literally like can't feel your hamstrings and blow up a balloon without using your back, it's not too much to ask to get someone to do, to do that because you're just trying to create a little bit of variability in the system because variability is what makes you more resistant to stress. Now, when you're talking about a really specialized sport, you can have too much variability that robs you of the adaptations you need to do that sport well, but it's also a Pop out to say, well, this person's just really special. We're not going to give them any. You know, I think there's still that we can change quickly without drastically altering how people, you know, squat under load or asking them to really dramatically change. It's like, hey, do these one or two things before you before your specific warm up, and then have at it. And then maybe at the end of it, just to facilitate recovery and just to get your body in a neurological state where it's not, you know, it's not in this high threshold performance type of environment. Then maybe you know do do one one or two things after you train. We're talking like five or ten minutes at the most, um, just to kind of get your body in more of a state of rest and get it out of that high threshold mode. So now when you go and walk home, your body your brain doesn't still think you're tra- training that you're actually relaxing. Well, it's 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 interesting. It's a really great conversation that you're starting up here. Where there. I like the point where you made there's a difference between you know moving under load correctly is great, but then also you know, we have to get past just laying on your back and using a balloon. So some of those specific exercises, so some of the stuff that we'll do is, um, you know, hollow holding, rolling, uh, going into Superman's dead bugs. Do you have uh, maybe some specifics in terms of exercises that folks should throw into their warm up to prep them to either maybe let's, let's take, for example, you know, Danny brought up the jerk, you know, what what would be a great warm up to kind of get, the uh the core or the trunk stabilized to uh to go overhead yeah and and just to you know to go back to the last question before i answer this yep. one it's not that most of these these movement related disciplines or assessment systems PRI, don't don't advocate that all you do is these low level things and even in pri they always progress people to standing activities but none of them it's more of a rehab centric system so none of them are really loaded and if you're trying to train someone to move on or load you have to move under load so sure. as far as like the warm-up goes i mean taking the jerk for example so if you, you want to prioritize overhead position with a good you know neutral rib cage and i'll, I'll give you guys this link as well i think a great thing and something i learned from pri is this lat hang exercise where you're you're hanging from a bar your feet are on the ground and your knees and hips are bent anywhere from 90 degrees it's just enough to basically support yourself on your on your feet and then to use your heels to do a, a very tiny pelvic hilt, tilt or hip extension to just recruit your hamstrings a little bit because that's going to help to, you know, if, you, if you're in a posterior pelvic tilt, your ribs can't be elevated up in the air. And then just go ahead and either breathe into a balloon or you don't have to if you don't want, but the balloon does help to resist the exhalation. So you're learning to hang from a bar with a good neutral rib cage. It's a great way to kind of open up the lats. And what it does that's really cool is when people have these huge rib flares or in these, you know, sort of overly extended states, 
think about breathing, right? Air is going to follow the path of least resistance. So if your ribs are up in the air in the front and your, your back is really extended and closed off, your, your lungs are very seldom going to fill in the, in the, in the posterior or the, the back aspect. So what this lat hang does is it basically closes off the front of your body with the abdominal activation and the, and the hamstring activation to bias air into your back. And that is a very powerful sensory input to sort of inhibit extensor tone and to, to get those lats to kind of quiet down. Because, like I said, all this stuff is neurological. And what's more, air and breathing. That's one of our vital needs. So if you can use the breath to influence that stuff, now you're, you're teaching good overhead position. And it's no different than what you're talking about with these hollow back stuff and the dead bugs. Just another way to do it. I think even things that aren't traditionally with rehab, like I love kettlebell arm bars. That's not typically a rehab exercise, but for you to do a kettlebell arm bar correctly, and the cool thing is you don't have to cue it because if people do it wrong, the weight's going to find them. So they have to reflexively do a lot of things well, and what they have to do is they have to really reach with their arm. When they do that, it's going to improve you know, serratus function, which is going to get that shoulder blade in a really good position. The serratus also retracts the rib cage or pulls it backwards. So when that serratus is firing, as it does in an arm bar, now your ribs are going to, by, by default, going to be in a good position. So I don't like to use things that are super cerebral with people. If you do something like a kettlebell arm bar or even a get-up variation, um, people have to stabilize themselves the right way or they just it's a self-correct exercise. Gymnastics rings are great. It's not overhead, but if you can even, I mean, even getting a really high-level athlete to just do a static hold on rings is very difficult for a lot of people. I mean, they shake like a leaf and there are people who tells when they do it but they're really internally rotated so they use this kind of like forward shoulder impingement pec dominant strategy to do it if you tell them hey i want you to really reach like drive your your palms into the rings or into the same cue you would use in a squat and a deadlift with the heels so drive your palms into the rings because and now you've got to generate stability proximally because the rings aren't stable. Now, if you say, I want you to externally rotate from your upper arm to now your lats and your pecs can't take over. So now you're using a lot of serratus, a lot of low trap, which is all the things that help to set that scapula and your, and your even your rib cage in a good position. Have them do that in seconds. All of them are going to be smoked. And now if you add, you know, a push up on a ring, if you even add front lever variations where you're prioritizing rib cage position, iron cross variations. I mean, Good, good is not distinct from, from rehab. So I don't, I, I mean, I think a lot of this stuff can, can be utilized in accessory work. So do your, you know, do your snatch, your squat first thing in your program or like your, your plyo stuff, and then just do, do some of it. Cause it's still, it's still very challenging. And it, people, you know, people don't want to do stuff that really feels easy. People want to be, especially like cross fit, expose to their weaknesses. Feel like, all right, like, yeah, it's, Great, you can you can 200 pounds with a crappy rib cage position, but let's let's put you on these rings. You can't support your body weight on rings. Like they're gonna they're gonna want to do it. Um, and so I think the rings, there's endless applications of, of what you can do there. Talk about the arm bars and the get ups, that lat hang stuff. And then even if you want, you know, the, the Y's and T's and some of the more the things people traditionally associate with physical therapy, your cuff work. Make sure that you're prioritizing rib cage position while you do it. So, like if you're just laying on a table prone or with your back really extended while you're doing these wides with a five pound dumbbell, are you really working the low trap if you're in this massive fixed spinal extension? If you have somebody get in a uh, like a like a rock back or a quadruped position or even an all fours position and do that where they're using their other arm drive into the floor, their elbow, we have nominal activation, set that. Now you're actually working your low trap and not just your spinal extensors. So you're working what you want to work. So I'm not opposed to any of that, that some of the low, lower level, like, you know, rotator cuff and, 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 and low trap activation type things that people do. But if you're going to do it, make sure that you have the good abdominal activation. You good position proximally you that if you're, if you're prioritizing spinal position, in everything that you do, because this stuff's not limited to your upper body. I mean, you should be doing what you deadlift, when you squat, when you do carries. If you're doing it all the time, then you don't need this direct rotator cuff work. People often associate all of them with the rotator cuff. And, you know, so if someone comes through a shoulder pain, you'll do like your manual muscle test on control changes and things get 
chest's weak when they're in pain it doesn't mean that like they that's why their shoulder is in a weak rotator cuff most people unless they've had a neurological insult aren't necessarily weak but the rotator cuff will work a lot better if you're it's truly working as a, as a stabilizer because the other stabilizers like the ones in your in your, your scapula and even proximally like in your abdominals are, are working better that that diminishes the the job that the rotator cuff has to do because they're very small muscles and if you're asking them to stabilize your shoulder in a crappy position because you know your rib cages your ribs are flare in the air and your sh- shoulder blades are forward your rotator cuff will lose every time if these other bigger muscles aren't doing their job. So this, you know, it's easy to say, what can people do before they train, but everything you do, this stuff matters and everything that you do. So if people have been doing something a different way for a long time, they might need to focus more on these very specific, more of like, you know, cerebral type drills. But like I said, once you, once you make, you need to do less and less of that, but I'll, uh, I'll send, you know, you guys the, the YouTube channel with some of the links that we have that we think it's like, Hey, if you, if you just want to do two things, Things before you do overhead work that like regardless of who you are you could benefit from almost any cross olympic type lifter or you know strength oriented person can benefit from doing some of this lot of mission work where they prioritize rib cage position and and you know no, no one's going to be worse off for it so i'll send you guys that and then anything else that you guys need we can go we can go back and forth and, and try to get you know get everybody what uh what they're looking for well, your uh, your practice's YouTube channel is great. So, you know, I, it, I would recommend regardless, go check that out um, for some ideas of some of these things to do. But, uh, you know, it's it, I guess to, to summarize what Doug's talking about in terms of, you know, how do we how do we improve some of the overhead position? You know, in particular, looking at something like the Olympic lifts or the jerk in particular, you know, the, the arm bars are, are great. You know, that's something that I think that uh, it surprises people how hard those actually are. Um, you know, the, the hanging position um, for the lats, as well as, you know, you could uh, even make that into a uh, kind of pseudo hollow position as well. Or like, for instance, try to do a pull up in a hollow position versus in your typical bent, you know, overextended position uh, with your legs behind your back. And it's dramatically different. You'll be uh, kind of shocked. And then the ring support holds are the other one. I, I, I completely agree. I think that's um, it's eye opening to people when they do those. So so, guys, if you're. You're struggling with a shoulder issue, which is is a is a very common um, injury in, in weightlifting and in CrossFit. You know, these are three things that you can start trying to add into your, uh, you know, your training, whether it be in your warm up or, you know, somewhere in your auxiliary training to really um, take a different approach at your shoulder besides maybe some of the things you have been doing, like your traditional rotator cuff uh, training. But, you know, one thing I did want to ask you about, too, uh, Doug, is, uh, you know, it seems like you're a big fan of carries and different um, different types of carries. Uh, what what kind of carries are your favorite carries for the kind of CrossFit weightlifting community and what, sh- what should they um, prioritize with those? Yeah, so, uh, and by the way, great point of the pull-offs. I should have mentioned that. I mean, you should be prioritizing the rib cage whenever you There are a lot of people who, like, how many pull-ups can you bang on? Oh, 20 or whatever. You have them, you know, either do, like, an L pull-up, which is going to get them abs and force them to keep their ribs in good position, or even just, like, bring their knees and hips and degrees like they're sitting in a chair. It dramatically changes that, that, that pull-up. So right. that's a great point, definitely something that I would add. As far as the, uh, the carries go, um, I love farmer's walks and like heavy farmer's walks. People do them where it's like, they, you know, they hold like a 36 pound kettlebell on each arm and they can do it for 10 minutes. Like I'm talking like you do it for like a hundred feet and you're, you know, you're walking like a, like a toddler at the end of it. Not quite that extreme, but I mean, it just, it just, it's so self-correcting in that you just, your body has to stabilize itself against these, you know, these really amazing torques at the hip joint. So you're talking about like glute medius. I mean, what's going to get your glute medius more doing a, a lateral band walk or like a really heavy farmer's walk. If you want to make it more challenging, offset the weight and do, you know, unequal weight in, in, in both hands. So that, that's a great thing. I love just some of the kettlebell, like front rack carry type stuff, because once again, just reflexively, you have to set the rib cage in a good position. It really gets those ribs down, gets the abdominals on and even some of the serratus and, and those things like Zercher carries. And even, you know, I wouldn't call it a carry per se, but I like the prowler whether it's the, the lower handle or the higher handle, doesn't really matter. But the key with the prowler to kind of really reinforce this rib cage stuff is if you want to set the rib cage with the prowler, you've got to drive through your heels. So even though everybody can use more weight if they go on their toes and get really close to the handle, if you keep your arms straight like you're reaching and drive through your heels, it's going to, once again, without any kind of cueing, put the rib cage where you want it. But the great thing about these carries is that they take, they're not technical with a couple of minor. The, the hardest part is just lifting the weight off the ground, making sure they do that like they would a good deadlift. Once they're walking with it, then it's just the body 
has got to find a way to stabilize itself. So those things are great. Um, I even, I don't have a yoke at my facility, but what we do play with a little bit is we've taken like a, a rogue safety bar. We get it, we get some chains and like, you know, one of those weight holders and we'll kind of improvise a yoke with that. I like it because you can use a little bit less load and get challenged. I mean, there are people who can walk with 700 pounds on a yoke and, you know, for the people that I tend to work with, I'm not working with professional strongmen. I'm working with work cleats or military guys. It's kind of like from a cost benefit standpoint, probably I'd rather be able to challenge them with a little bit less load, even though I still want to load them. But you talk about like core stability. I mean, you walk around with that safety squat, yoke concoction, like your abs will do things you never felt them do before. And once again, it takes no cueing. So those things are great. They're not technical. The only the thing about it is, depending on where you train, you need some space to do it. And, you know, where I am at, at CrossFit Salt, it's a great facility. They've got like a, you know, 100-foot turf area, so we can do them there. But, um, yeah, I mean, great things, and they really, once again, just pr- prioritize the, the spinal position without a lot of cueing, which, you know, like we get geeked out over this stuff, but the average person who trains, they just want to do something and have it fix things, and that's why these carries are really good. Yeah, and it, you, while you're going through the carry, you bring up a interesting exercise like a zercher carry. A lot of people aren't familiar with what that is, and 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 there's some other neat, different exercises. Like for example, I was introduced by a weightlifting coach with a kind of like a Jefferson curl style or rounded back deadlift, which which I found really advantageous to my training. It's they're not exercises I really go crazy heavy with where I'm working for a one rep max, but kind of working through some awkward range of motion. I found really helpful with, you know, my snatching and my cleaning and jerk and, and other performance based exercises that I'm doing. I guess my question for you, when we're talking about a Zercher carry or Jefferson curl or these kind of awkward exercises where we do begin to incorporate some some rib positioning, what's the what's the big benefit there? Is this something where we work through an awkward range of motion and strengthening something, or we're just trying to keep a full range of motion with these joints? Um uh, speak on the benefits of just awkward carries, kind of strange, awkward exercises, and just kind of maybe getting away from the barbell and not being so focused on this whole neutral, this neutral spine idea. Yeah, no, I mean, really good question. I think with the with the Zercher variations, you're going to tend to be a lot more neutral on the spine, more so than you would with like a Jefferson deadlift. And yeah. it's one of those things where like if I saw somebody Jefferson deadlifting the gym, as long as they have like a good reason for doing it, if, if they think that's how you're supposed to deadlift, we've got to have a conversation. But if they're doing it because, look, I mean, no matter how good you are, you're going to miss lifts if you're a lifter. If sure. you play sports, you know, you can't, you can't have a neutral spine all the time if you're a wrestler. You know what I mean? Like you're going to be pulling people towards you or grappling and, and disadvantageous. So there's only, you know, I can't sit in a helicopter and treat a patient with a neutral spine for three hours. Like, That's right. so uh, you're, you're going, to, you're, you're going to be in, in compromising position. So as long as you're doing it systematically, like in a, in a Jefferson deadlift where, you know, you recognize that it's not for Mac, it's not a max effort activity, but it should, it is a way to, if you do it progressively to build resiliency in the tissues in these end range disadvantageous positions. Now it's like anything else. There's the, the sort of like, if you do, if you exceed the threshold for what the tissues can handle, it's a recipe for injury, so you've got to be smart about it. But like, I don't know if you guys have heard of the uh, the functional range conditioning course with Andrew Spina. He speaks a lot about you know doing this where you're training at these end ranges in what might be construed as bad positions, but you know you need this this variability because life is unpredictable. So definitely, you know, like if I was training somebody initially, I I probably wouldn't. The first thing I did wouldn't be a Jefferson deadlift, but if I'm training somebody who's competent in hip hinging. Like, yeah, and, and they play a sport that requires them to do something like that. Let, let's go ahead and do it because, you know, if you, if you only train in one position, you, you develop tissue tolerance and motor control in that position. And there's some over a little bit from a degree standpoint, but if you never train in, you know, with, with if you ever train outside of what, what can be construed as really good mechanics, you know, purposefully, then you, once again, you're leaving potential on the table. So there's definitely a place for that stuff. I mean, even in, uh, strong men they do like the stone lifting I wouldn't do that with someone to the point where like I wanted them to compete unless they were a strong man and they were trained to failure but to, to be able to learn how to you know stabilize yourself with a little bit of a rounded back so that's going to force your hips to be you know that much more stable I think it's a good thing so as long as you have reasons for doing these things there's there's certainly a place for them and we know that sports aren't perfect and people people don't get hurt in good positions they get hurt in bad positions so there's two ways to sort of mitigate that one is to 
teach people good positions. The other is in a controlled way, train in quote unquote bad positions, you know, safely and smartly so that when they inevitably do go there, maybe they have a little, little bit of motor control and tissue tolerance. Because if you don't train it at all, then you're rolling the dice when they inevitably do, you know, land the wrong way if they're trying to catch a football or, or miss a snatch. So definitely there's a place for it. I think that, you know, I'm glad you brought it up because people are so obsessed with what they perceive as like perfect movement now. And there's really no such thing. It's all about context. So how you, how you train it and what your goals are are to dictate how much you deviate from these mechanics, but in certain contexts you have to do it. And it's important. I think if you really want to see what you're talking about in action, um, just go watch like a, uh, adult league softball game and <laughs> oh, yeah. you know you'll it's it's you know and I, I was just at one the other day and there was uh, i think two hamstring pulls and somebody rolled their ankle <laughs> and and it's and, and these are not people that are out of shape either these people are like pretty fit but they tr- they train in the sagittal plane only and then all of a sudden they're asked to you know in a competitive environment change direction and or rotate you know fast as they swing and and um their body is just not used to that anymore even though they may have some you know, motor control from what, when they played baseball in high school or college, uh, and they hurt themselves. And it's, it's, you know, very common to see that. So yeah, I like that approach that, you know, train resiliency in bad positions and, and train be, to be strong in good positions as well. I think you kind of have to do both, but, um, you know, Doug, this, this is, you know, I, I feel like we could go on and, and, uh, and, and just go for a couple hours. I think we probably have to have you back on for a part two, because I think this is a pretty good, a pretty good place to uh, to cut it and, and get a little bit more information about where people can uh, can get in contact with you. But um, this has been a super cool talk, and I'm sure there'll be people that want to reach out to you about your practice. So so if people are interested in what you guys are doing, or they want to um, you know they want to do some work with you, let's say they're in the area, where, where can they find out more information about what you guys are doing? Yeah, so our uh, our website is resilientpt.nyc, and then we have a uh, Instagram. Our Instagram handle is resilientppt. Um, I'm on green feet pt green feet is kind of like a pj thing and then um, we've got a youtube channel too so if you just go on youtube and type in resilient performance physical therapy we'll be there um so but yeah we, we love doing this stuff and interacting with people so hit us up on any of those social media things and you know if you want to continue the conversation there we can certainly do that no i'm fired up to do it there's um i got a i got another page i got to get to on you doug but um this is really fun for me um it's cool stuff and um, super interesting. I always love when uh, the, when we talk to PTs and they bring up things like chains and kettlebells, and I think those are to me are the kind of PTs that uh, that that I would search for. Or you know, if I had athletes who were hurt, you, you guys are the kind of PTs that I'm going to push them towards. So um, we appreciate your feedback. We appreciate your time. And uh, Danny, I think that Doug Doug's putting it out there and proving that if you have a body, you're an athlete. What's going on, gang? Coach Joe here to talk to you a little bit about Performa Sleep. Guys, Performa Sleep has worked with industry experts to develop the ideal mattress for athletes and active people looking to improve their performance through better sleep. Guys, Performa Sleep is proud to say that every single Performa Sleep mattress is made in the USA and ships quickly from their warehouse to your door and hopefully gets in your bedroom pretty quick. Guys, I sleep on a Performa Sleep mattress. I absolutely love it. It's the only mattress on the market with copper cool technology. And I can say right now as a guy who sleeps hot, who sleeps with the sweats, I don't anymore in my Performa Sleep mattress. Check it out. Folks like myself, like Dr. Danny, Lauren Fisher, Emily Bridgers, Scott Pancheck are on the Performa Sleep mattress and have nothing but great things to say about it. So head over to PerformaSleep.com and click their big red buy now button and enjoy.